As we inch even closer to our 24th anniversary on the air, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, Planet Earth's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the Earth as we come to air with edition number 1,239 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The ARRL urges amateurs to support young hams on Giving Tuesday. The 2022 ARRL Board of Director election results are announced. Eastern Massachusetts welcomes a new ARRL section manager, while incumbent section managers are re-elected. Skywarn Recognition Day is coming up on December 3rd. NASA unexpectedly lost contact with the Orion spacecraft during this past week. The Internet Archive's new digital library of amateur radio and communications breaks the 25,000 item mark. The Radio Society of Great Britain sets up transatlantic contacts to relive history during the entire month of December. The Dayton Hamvention announces the theme for next year's Hamfest. The Canadian Amateur Radio Hall of Fame selects its 2022 candidate. Santa will be all over the amateur airwaves in December. We will highlight a few of them for you. And researchers have developed a new ultra-small battery that shows lots of promise. We will tell you all about it in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. Once again, we'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will tell you that if you are having trouble using technology, that it is not your fault. Australia's own Anno Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will talk about the nature of learning things. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill takes us back to the great VHF frequency allocation battle of the mid-1940s. Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will talk about the best ways to secure tower-mounted electronics. And we will have the latest news from Parks on the Air and Summits on the Air with Mark here and 3VWM. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in beautiful downtown Albany, New York, where we still don't have any snow, I'm George W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Reporting from just outside the capital of New York State in Glenmont, New York, this is Bob, W3BOO, Boo Radio. And reporting from our radio station atop the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York. With the Thanksgiving leftover locker is <laughs> exuding leftovers at a frantic pace, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau, where we're still sleeping off the turkey, I'm Eric, KD2RJX. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, I'm Fred, November Fox, 2 Fox. And reporting from our News Bureau in Rochester, New York, along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from our News Bureau, just outside Albany, New York, in the Geek Cave Studios, I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. And reporting from my home studio in Cortlandville, New York, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And now with this week's lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Leading off our news this week, Giving Tuesday is November 29th, 2022, a growing annual movement where individuals and organizations like ARRL come together to unleash the power of radical generosity. Many ARRL programs and services are not covered by membership fees alone. Your contributions have a tremendous impact on ARRL's ability to promote and protect amateur radio and better serve its members. You can donate to ARRL now at www.arrl.org forward slash give. That address again, www.arrl.org forward slash give. This year, ARRL's theme for hashtag Giving Tuesday is Young Hams. 
ARRL is already doing so much to grow and encourage our community of young radio amateurs. Just imagine how much more we can do with your help. The next generation of radio amateurs is already here, says ARRL staff member Bob Enderbitzen, NQ1R, who co-advises the ARRL Collegiate Amateur Radio Program. There is a vibrant, well-networked community of students and campus radio clubs at colleges and universities throughout the nation. School teachers and local radio clubs work together to bring amateur radio into classrooms. Youth programs, including amateur radio on the International Space Station and outreach to scouts, bring together our unique partnership to introduce ham radio to more kids. From now to hashtag Giving Tuesday, ARRL wants to raise $25,000 to help support and expand our programs and initiatives for young hams, including ARRL Student Membership Discount. Did you know that ARRL membership is only $25 for individuals under 26 years old? Your gift will help subsidize ARRL Student Membership. ARRL Youth Licensing Grants. ARRL covers the one-time $35 FCC application fee for new licensed candidates younger than 18 years old for tests administered under the ARRL VEC program. Also, their exam session fee is reduced to only $5 versus its normal rate at $15. Outreach to teachers and schools. ARRL has resources to help educators and volunteers bring ham radio into classrooms, engaging students in science, technology, engineering, math, and the arts, or STEM slash STEAM. ARRL is inspiring students to pursue higher education and career paths in radio technology and radio communications. ARRL Collegiate Amateur Radio Program Since 2017, the ARRL Collegiate Amateur Radio Program has networked students and their campus radio clubs. We engage students in monthly meetings and drawings, best practices for vibrant college clubs, and notices of career opportunities. The next generation of young hams are already active, engaged, and on the air. Kids Day and School Club Roundup ARRL sponsors on-the-air fun for young hams. Promoting partnerships. ARRL's partnerships support many youth programs, including amateur radio on the International Space Station and outreach to scouts. A short video on ARRL's YouTube channel includes young hams describing why they love ham radio. Join the hashtag Giving Tuesday movement and help ARRL support our next generation of radio amateurs. They're already here. Let's keep them active, involved, and engaged in amateur radio. Make your gift now at www.arrl.org forward slash give. That address again, www.arrl.org forward slash give. ARRL Southeastern Division Director Mickey Baker, N4MB of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, overcame challengers for his position in the 2023 to 2025 election cycle. Ballots counted November 18th showed Baker with 2,785 votes, defeating Challenger's Vice Director James Schilling, KG4JSZ, with 1,000 votes, and John Willis, KB4DU, with 673 votes. For the position of Vice Director, Jeff Beals, WA4AW, with 1,516 votes, of Loxahatchee, Florida, defeated challengers Andrew Maluzzi, KK4LWR, with 1,287 votes, Neil Solmeyer, K4EA, with 859 votes, and Joseph Tertilli, N4ZUW, with 763 votes. Baker and Beals have been declared elected for the terms beginning January 1st, 2023. Baker is finishing his first term as an ARRL director. He currently serves on the Administrative and Finance Committee and Logbook of the World Committee. Southeastern Division members had the option to vote using paper or electronic ballots. The election was conducted by third-party election services company of Melville, New York, which had been selected by the ARRL Ethics and Elections Committee. The tabulation was observed by the ARRL Ethics and Elections Committee Chairperson, Midwest Division Director Art Ziegelbaum, K0AIZ. Those were the only contested races in this year's election cycle for Director and Vice Director. In August, the incumbents in the other four divisions running unopposed in this election cycle were declared winners. They are Pacific Director Kristen McIntyre, K6WX, and Vice Director Anthony Marson, W7XM. Rocky Mountain Division Director Jeff Ryan, K0RM, and Vice Director Dan Grady, N2SRK. Southwestern Division Director Richard Norton, N6AA, and Vice Director Edward Stearns, AA7A. 
and West Gulf Division Director John Robert Stratton, N5AUS, and Vice Director Lee Cooper, W5LHC. The ARRL is governed by its Board of Directors. Elections are held for five of the 15 ARRL divisions each year for terms of three years. John McCombie, N1ILZ, will become Section Manager of the ARRL Eastern Massachusetts Section on January 1st, 2023. McCombie of Eastham was the only nominee to submit a petition to run for office when the nomination period closed in early September. As the sole nominee, he has been declared elected. This past year, McCombie has been assistant section manager to Tom Walsh, K1TW, who has been the section manager of the Eastern Massachusetts section for the last eight years. Walsh of Bedford decided not to run for a fifth two-year term of office. There were no balloted elections during the fall season's section manager election cycle. The following incumbent section managers ran unopposed and they were declared re-elected beginning their new two-year terms of office on January 1, 2023. Cecil Higgins, AC0HA of Missouri, Matt Anderson, KA0BOJ representing Nebraska, Jim Mezzi, W2KFV in the New York City, Long Island area, Rocco Conti, WU2M in Northern New York, Mark Tarpley, N4UFP from South Carolina, Tom Prizer, N2XW in Southern New Jersey, Michael Douglas, W4MDD in the West Central Florida area, and Joe Shupenis, W3BC in Western Pennsylvania. The Federal Communications Commission has approved rules for implementing the new broadband labels required by Congress. The commission had been contemplating such a label for several years and came out with a voluntary version in 2016. The use of the label was since mandated in the Biden administration's Infrastructure Act with its billions in broadband subsidies, so the commission is at the task in earnest. The FCC report and order, which is the final decision barring appeal, requires broadband providers to display the service nutrition labels, which include prices, speeds, fees, and any data allowances at the point of sale. That means the actual label, not a link to the label or an icon, must be prominently displayed in proximity to any ads, as well as easily accessible to the customer's online account portals. The information also has to be machine readable. While the label has to be on ISP websites, ads, and other marketing materials, it does not have to be on monthly bills, which did not please label fan consumer reports. Consumer Reports hopes the FCC will revisit this ruling and require ISPs to provide a broadband label on every monthly bill, Consumer Reports said. The FCC also has signaled it is willing to refine and improve the labels and adopted a further notice of proposed rulemaking so that stakeholders can weigh in on those. By moving forward to implement broadband nutrition labels, the FCC will help empower consumers to make informed choices in today's highly competitive broadband marketplace. Jonathan Spalter, president of UST Telecom, the Broadband Association, said, Consumers have lots of options when selecting their services, and these new labels should be a simple tool to help with comparison shopping. The annual Skywarn Recognition Day for on-the-air activity will take place on Saturday, December 3rd of 2022, from 0000 to 2400 UTC. For U.S. time zones, the activity begins on the evening of Friday, December 2nd, 2022. With more details on Skywarn Recognition Day, we go to John Ross, KD8IDJ, who files this report from League Headquarters. Skywarn Recognition Day was developed in 1999 by the National Weather Service and ARRL to honor the contributions that Skywarn volunteers make to the National Weather Service mission, the protection of life and property during threatening weather. During the Skywarn special events, hams will operate from several National Weather Service offices as well as from their mobile, home, and club stations. The relationship between amateur radio and operators and the National Weather Service is extremely important for relaying information during storms of any type, said ARRL Director of Emergency Management Josh Johnston, KE5MHV. Skywarn is a perfect example of the value of hams working together with government partners during times of disaster. 
The Skywarn Storm Spotter Program has been a mechanism used by the National Weather Service for years to educate people on what to watch for during weather events and to provide a source of information to the National Weather Service offices. For information about the Skywarn Spotter courses, which are available to anyone around the country or online, you can visit www.weather.gov slash Skywarn. I'm John Ross, KD8 IDJ. That address again for information about Skywarn Spotter courses, which are available to anyone around the country or online, visit www.weather.gov slash Skywarn. Program courses provide information on reportable criteria for cloud formations and even what to look for during the formation of supercells, which may cause tornadoes or other potentially dangerous weather events. Individuals and the National Weather Service officer amateur radio stations who are planning on operating for the Skywarn Recognition Day should register to participate. All amateur radio stations and Skywarn spotters that register will receive a Skywarn Recognition Day number to their email address once registered. Information about participating, registration, and a spotter recognition map is available at www.weather.gov slash crh slash Skywarn Recognition. In-person amateur radio operations will be determined by each local National Weather Service forecast office. Amateur radio operators must make all necessary inquiries with the appropriate National Weather Service staff at your respective National Weather Forecast Office ahead of Skywarn Recognition Day. Look for station WX1AW, operated by ARRL Emergency Management Assistant Ken Bailey, K1FUG, during Skywarn Recognition Day. WX1AW will be active on 40 through 10 meters using single sideband and FT8 modes and will monitor local VHF and UHF repeaters. Contacts will be uploaded to the LOTW after the event. QSL via the station license address with a self-adjust stamped envelope. And more information is again available at www.arrl.org slash skywarn dash recognition dash day. NASA experienced a data connection glitch between the Orion spacecraft and ground control for nearly an hour early Tuesday morning and a surprising disruption to the craft's otherwise fair-weather journey around the moon. Data was lost between Orion and NASA's mission control at Johnson Space Center for 47 minutes from 1.09 a.m. Eastern Time to 1.56 a.m. Eastern Time, according to a NASA blog post. The data loss occurred while the team was working on a communication link between the spacecraft and the deep space network, the array of antennas that connect spacecraft with ground controls. Orion is currently 11 days through a 25.5 day journey to the moon and back. The Artemis 1 spacecraft performed a successful flyby of the moon on Monday, during which time NASA temporarily and unexpectedly lost contact with the Orion for 34 minutes as the capsule passed behind the moon. The Monday flyby was the Horizon capsule's closest approach of the moon. The spacecraft is now en route to its distant retrograde orbit. NASA isn't exactly sure what caused the issue, and the team is now examining data from before and after the communication disruption to understand what happened. The reconfiguration has been conducted successfully several times in the last few days, NASA wrote, making the recent anomaly a bit of a head-scratcher. The issue was resolved on the ground side, that is. Orion didn't correct the issue on its end. Data recorded on Orion's end during the outage will also be scrutinized. Orion is otherwise performing well, and the NASA team isn't actively anticipating another outage. The space agency has troubleshooted more than a dozen anomalies with Orion during the past 11 days, but nothing terribly serious, as Mike Serafin, Artemis 1 mission manager, told reporters on Friday. That said, getting to the bottom of this latest issue would certainly assuage any worries the team might have. At the same time, and as Orion continues on its journey, NASA will keep a watchful eye on the spacecraft's communications. Should the rest of Orion's return prove uneventful, the spacecraft will face its biggest test yet, a successful re-entry through Earth's atmosphere. All this is, hopefully, paving the way for Artemis II, a repeat of Artemis I, but with actual astronauts on board. That mission is expected to launch in late 2024, until then, we can cross our fingers for steady communications from the spacecraft and a quick answer to the data loss event.
In the six weeks since announcing that Internet Archive has begun gathering content for the Digital Library of Amateur Radio and Communications, or DLARC, the project has quickly grown to more than 25,000 items, including ham radio newsletters, podcasts, videos, books, and catalogs. The project seeks additional contributions of material for the free online library. You are welcome to explore the content currently in the library and watch the primary collection as it grows at archive.org forward slash details forward slash DLARC. Again, that's archive.org forward slash details forward slash DLARC. The new material includes historical and modern newsletters from diverse amateur radio groups, including the National Radio Club of Aurora, Colorado, the Telford and District Amateur Radio Society based in the United Kingdom, the Malta Amateur Radio League, and the South African Radio League. The Tri-State Amateur Radio Society contributed more than 200 items of historical correspondence, newspaper clippings, ham festival flyers and newsletters. Other publications include Selvamar Noticias, a multilingual digital ham radio magazine, and Florida Skip, an amateur radio newspaper published from 1957 through 1994. The library also includes the complete run of 73 magazine, more than 500 issues, which are freely and openly available. More than 300 radio-related books are available in DLARC via controlled digital lending. These materials may be checked out by anyone with a free Internet Archive account for a period of one hour to two weeks. Radio and communication books donated to Internet Archive are scanned and added to the DLARC lending library. Amateur radio podcasts and video channels are also among the first batch of material in the DLARC collection. These include Ham Nation, Foundations of Amateur Radio, the ICQ Amateur and Ham Radio Podcast, with many more to come. Providing a mirror and archive for born digital content such as video and podcasts is one of the core goals of DLARC. Additions to DLARC also include Presentations recorded at radio communications conferences, including GRCCon, the GNU Radio Conference, and the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo. A growing reference library of past radio catalogs includes catalogs from Ham Radio Outlet and C Crane. DLARC is growing to be a massive online library of materials and collections related to amateur radio and early digital communications. It is funded by a significant grant from Amateur Radio Digital Communications, ARDC, to create a digital library that documents, preserves, and provides open access to the history of this community. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to be one of the pioneering contributors to the DLARC. Anyone with material to contribute to the DLARC library questions about the project, or interest in similar digital library building projects for other professional communities, please contact K. Savitz, K6KJN, Program Manager Special Collections, via email at k, that's spelled k-a-y, at archive.org. Again, that's k, spelled k-a-y, at archive.org. The Board of Trustees of the Canadian Amateur Radio Hall of Fame is pleased to announce that Brian Rawlings, VE3QN, has been named to the Hall of Fame. Radio Amateurs of Canada recognizes deserving amateurs by appointments to the Canadian Amateur Radio Hall of Fame. The Constitution for the Hall specifies that the appointment as member of the Hall is made for outstanding achievement and excellence of the highest degree for serious and sustained service to amateur radio in Canada or to amateur radio at large. The trustees of the hall have interpreted the constitution to mean that the person has performed significant service over many years to enhance the well-being of amateur radio. 
Brian Rawlings was first licensed as VE2AME in Montreal in 1959. Despite long absences from amateur radio while living overseas in Saudi Arabia and Russia, Brian Rawlings has again been an active amateur since 2002, now signing VE3QN from Ottawa. From 2006 until 2020, Brian represented Canadian amateur radio interests as the main RAC contributor to the planning for attendance at the International Telecommunications Union Worldwide Conferences in 2012, 15, and 19. This involved not only attendance at the conferences themselves, but also at the national and international meetings in preparation for the conferences. He also played a key role in obtaining support, both nationally and internationally, for amateur-related issues, including successes in gaining amateur access in many countries to frequencies at both 60 and 630 meters. More than 1,000 children are expected to have their moment on the air this year as the 3916 net kicks off its 17th year of the Santa net. When this beloved holiday tradition began 17 years ago, only a handful of youngsters checked in with the assistance of licensed amateur radio operators. If you've been a very good ham this year, you can help a young person be a third-party operator and get that important contact on 3.916 MHz. The net begins on Friday, November 25th at 7.15 p.m. Central Time or 0115 UTC. Santa will be on the air every night on the same frequency and at that same time until Christmas Eve, December 24th. Just as Santa himself might say, this is a team effort. Organizer Pete Thompson, KE5GGY, said that radio operators who belong to the 3916 net work as relays to ensure everyone gets heard. This is understandably the favorite time of year on 3.916 MHz for these operators. You can even check in before the net at cqsanta.com. That site again, cqsanta.com. Everyone is hoping for good propagation. Meanwhile, if you're unable to reach Santa on HF, he's still reachable by repeater and on Echolink. Santa will be taking calls from November 27th to December 9th thanks to the teamwork of the Longmont Amateur Radio Club and the Northern Colorado Amateur Radio Club. Linked UHF and VHF repeaters in Colorado will be on the air with Santa, who will be reachable on Echolink node 8305 via the Longmont Club repeater W0ENO-R. We have more on this operation in this report. For the third year in a row, Longmont kids will have the chance to talk to Santa over the radio. The Longmont Amateur Radio Club is once again hosting St. Nick over the waves for this year's Santa on the air. Club president Chuck Pock explained that the idea to let kids talk to Santa via amateur radio came to him in late 2020, when the pandemic meant that both children and Santa would have to avoid crowded places. I knew Santa wouldn't be able to see the kids at the mall or talk to them potentially except maybe by phone or Zoom, Pock said. I figured what's another good method that the kids can talk to Santa and do it in a way that's not common. Amateur radio, also known as ham radio, has been around for over 100 years. Pock, who's been practicing the hobby for eight years, also saw the method as a way to get young people interested in the unique hobby. Santa has done other programs where he's broadcasted on high-frequency radio, but Santa on the air is more localized using repeaters in Longmont. To speak with Santa, children will need to find an amateur radio operator who can connect them directly to him. Pock said he decided to continue the radio program this year for kids and families who might still feel uncomfortable in crowded public places, along with educating children about the benefits and science behind radio. It's a hobby that has to do with the basics, STEM, he said. It's all involved in amateur radio because you have to learn how radio waves work and how different frequencies modulate different ways. This year the Longmont Amateur Radio Club is teaming up with the Northern Colorado Amateur Radio Club in Fort Collins to provide more opportunities for kids to connect with Santa, and the program will run two weeks instead of one. Potch is hoping at least 100 children will be able to speak with Santa. I'm going to keep doing it right now, until I can't do it anymore or something major happens, he said. Santa will be sending his QSL card to kids who chat with him, which is a type of contact card used in amateur radio that displays a picture with the station's call sign and contact information. The cards will be posted marked from the North Pole, and Santa's station call sign is, of course, N0P. Santa on the Air will run 5 to 7 p.m. on November 27, 6 to 7.30 p.m. November 28 to December 3, 5 to 6 p.m. December 4, and 6 to 7.30 p.m. December 5 to December 9. Santa can be reached via repeaters or Echolink. That note again, Echolink node, 
8305 via the Longmont Club repeater W0ENO-R. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Any way that the internet and the computing and digital technology are changing our lives, that's what we talk about right here. I have a motto. Actually, I didn't realize it, but I've had this motto since 98. But I think it actually, I owe it to Walt Mossberg. And by the way, a tip of the hat to Walt Mossberg, the senior technology journalist who just retired. He was at the Wall Street Journal writing the personal tech column for more than 20 years. And uh, he then went off, started his own company, Recode, and he's just retired. He wrote his last column last week. And I didn't realize it, but I, but he published, republished his first column from 1991 when I was just starting doing uh, technology radio. I'd been a tech reporter for many years. but And in that very first column, he said, computers don't often work well, but if they don't, it's not your fault. And that's my motto. I I I guess great minds, or maybe I, I read it and forgot I'd read it and remembered it, but that's been my motto ever since 1998. If if this stuff doesn't work well, we the reason is we tend to blame ourselves. We're just, oh, I just don't understand it, or I don't get computers, or I'm just not good at this. And it's not. It's poorly designed hardware and software because if it were well designed, you'd know how to use it. There's a great, uh, boy, a great designer and usability expert, Donald Norman. And uh, he wrote a wonderful uh, book. What was it called? The Design of Everyday Things? I think so. But Don Norman uh, is is kind of a design guru for many of us. And he says, if something's well designed, you should know how to use it. For instance, if you come up to a door and there's a... Uh, a handle for pulling it, well, you know that that door goes in. And if there's a bar for pushing, you know you push that door out, right? And if, heaven forbid, somebody should reverse that and put a handle for pulling on a door that you push, well, that's going to be extremely confusing. Is it your fault that you, the door doesn't work right? No. The person who put the wrong handle on the door. The cover of the design of Everyday Things is wonderful because it's a, <laughs> it's a teapot. Well, a not so well designed teapot because the handle's on the same side as the spout. Now, if anybody's designing a teapot, you put the handle on one side, the spout on the other side, so you can pour it out. Lift my handle and pour me out. But if you were to put the handle on the same side as the spout, it'd be pretty darn hard to pour any tea without burning yourself, right? So his point, and I think uh, you know, he's he's actually made quite a business of informing the tech industry. He's down in Silicon Valley and on usability. His point is the way something is designed should make it apparent that this is how you use it. And if it isn't, if you don't really understand it, or if you look at it and you can't figure it out, it's not your fault. It's the designer's fault. And I hope we remember this because, come on, every day in technology, it's as if we're coming up to a door that you push, but it's got a puller on it. It is I, I can't tell you how often I'll look at a screen and go, I have no idea what I'm supposed to do here. And I'm a technologist. I use this stuff all the time. It's my business. I really don't understand. I don't understand at all how people <laughs> survive in this world. Do you do you uh, do you have any remotes for your TV? How many? This is a test of a geek. How many remote controls do you have in front of your you know on the arm of your couch or in front of your TV? You know we're about to go on vacation and I <laughs> we have a visitor uh, staying in our you know somebody staying in our house to take care of it. And we actually had to write, I've written a manual, seven or eight page manual, and we had to write post-it notes to explain this remote does this. To, to watch the TV, you, you, you turn on this remote and you press this button, and then you turn on that remote and you press that button, and then here's the third remote that you use to control, that's how you get to Netflix. Oh, you want to watch TV, the basketball game? And I know it's confusing. But it isn't my fault, and it's not your fault, and it's not Burke, who's staying in our house's fault. It's the designers of these systems' fault. They don't. Now, there are universal remotes out there. I have yet to find one that can really solve my complicated TV setup. Logitech Harmony, right? And then there's a Harmony Hub, and I've bought them all over time, Logitech One. Burke, you're going to be able to figure this out because we put Post-it notes, and I have a printed manual Yes, this is it. Perk has just brought me the picture. Because <laughs> I think maybe you don't believe me when I say we've we've got the remotes and we've got post-it notes 
And all, just to explain. But, you know, I told Lisa, my wife, Burke says one of them was wrong. I told her that Burke doesn't need this. You can figure this out. It didn't hurt, he says. You've noticed, though, haven't you, that there are some people, I don't know if it's genetic or what, that just, they can look at it. I'm one of those people. I can sit down at any AV system and go, oh, yeah, you do this, this, and this. I can figure it out. I bet you're like that. Yeah. And then there are people who look at it and go, I don't know what to do here. The problem is the people who design software, the people who design computers, the people who design remote controls are of the first kind. They're the kind of people who could sit down and look at something and go, oh, I know how this works. And they don't understand that most other people have no idea. You ask an engineer, why did you design this website like that? I can't figure out. He said, well, that's obvious. Didn't you see the button? And you... There's a big debate in design circles about something they call the hamburger menu. Now, I look at that and I know what to do. You've seen it. Many web pages. Now, software is doing it. A lot of mobile software is doing it. It's three lines. They call it a hamburger because it's like a bun, a patty, and a bun. Three lines. Have you seen that? What do you think of when you see that? Do you think of a hamburger? Do you know what to do when you see that? When we designed our website, the designer said, you can't use the hamburger menu. I said, what? I said, no one understands what those three lines are. I said, it's a menu. You hit it and it's a menu. Well, you know that, but no one else knows that. And by the way, almost everywhere now, that's what you see is a hamburger menu. I guess we eventually we'll learn. It's one of the things I kind of laugh when people say, oh, the iPhone is so easy to use. It is not easy to use. The iPhone is really hard to use because every application has a different user interface, right? There's Apple, when they designed the Macintosh, they actually wrote, there were four or five giant volumes. There was a whole thing on user interface guidelines. There was one way to do it, and they were very clear. This is how you do it. And software on the Mac, on the original Mac, was very easy to use because everybody did it the same way. For some reason, they neglected to do that for the iPhone. And every app, has a different way to do things. In fact, in some cases, now you tell me if you're an iPhone user. In some cases, you're on a screen, you have, there is no, you know, you'd think, oh, is there an arrow in the upper left-hand corner? How do I get back? How do I go to the previous screen? And in some, in many cases, there is no way. You just sit there, and I guess what you're supposed to do is press the home button and start over. That is not good design. <laughs> Anyway, my motto, uh, apparently stolen from Walt Mossberg, his motto for many years, mine as well, it is not your fault. And that's really, if there were one kind of underlying philosophy to this show is, it's not a case of, I know how to use this, you don't, let me teach you at all. At all. I do have that gene where I can, you know, look at this stuff and figure it out most of the time. You know, I'm one of those people. But... That doesn't mean I'm, you know, in any way better. Really, the message is none of this stuff is well designed. Even I am baffled often by the user interface on hardware and software. And we're just going to have to stick together and figure it out together. And that's what we do on this show. We figure it out together. So I'm so glad you're here. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another excursion into amateur radio history? This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another installment of the Ancient Amateur Archives. If Arthur Miller, Tennessee Williams, or Eugene O'Neill had been amateur radio operators, one of them certainly would have written a play about the VHF frequency allocation battle of the mid-1940s. For, except for sex, this event had all the elements of a great drama. Power, passion, politics, greed, and sudden twists and turns in the plot were the hallmark of this epic battle. It hastened the destruction of probably the greatest man in the history of radio, solidified the stronghold of another in his quest for total television domination, doomed a viable alternative in the infant television industry, and gave birth to the predecessor of CB Radio. Got your attention? Then let's open our playbills and read The Cast of Characters. The ARRL and the 50,000 amateur radio operators. Prior to World War II, hams were virtually the only major users of the UHF spectrum as the frequencies above 25 megacycles were then known. They had the use of the 10 meter band from 28 to 30 megacycles and 5 meters from 56 to 60 megacycles since the late 1920s as well as a small slice of spectrum at 400 megacycles. 
In the late 1930s, the FCC had allocated two new amateur bands to amateurs, two and a half meters from 112 to 116 megacycles, and one and a quarter meters from 224 to 230 megacycles. Except for 10 meters, most of the operations on these frequencies were done with very simple equipment. Modulated oscillators and super regenerative receivers were the mainstay of their activities. For those not familiar with this type of equipment, a modulated oscillator was a tube coupled to a tuned circuit directly on the desired frequency, which was modulated by another tube. Since crystal control and frequency multiplication were not used, the resulting signal varied in both frequency and amplitude when the oscillator was modulated. The only way to receive such an unstable signal was with a super regenerative receiver. Invented by Major Edwin Armstrong in the early 1920s, the Super Jenny was extremely sensitive but very broad-banded. It gave off a loud rushing noise like an FM receiver unsquelched. A complete phone station of this type could be built with only three tubes, an important consideration for the Depression-era hams. Except for limited operation on the 112 through 116 megacycle band in World War II under WERS, or the War Emergency Radio Service, amateur stations had been silent since December 7, 1941. Now, late in 1944, with the end of the war in sight and new VHF-UHF tubes in production for the war effort, the ARRL was making plans for more bands above 25 megacycles. Major Edwin H. Armstrong The unquestioned father of modern radio, Major Armstrong had experienced several setbacks in the 1920s and 1930s, partly because of his secretive nature and uncompromising attitude. He had delayed in obtaining his original patent on the regenerative detector, and, when he did finally apply, he omitted the oscillating properties of the circuit. Lee DeForest challenged Armstrong on this invention by submitting a circuit of his own that he claimed he developed in mid-1912. Armstrong initially won based on the fact that DeForest's design was basically uncontrolled feedback. When, however, Armstrong flaunted his court victory, by flying a flag with his patent number on it where DeForest could see it, and when Armstrong refused to grant DeForest a license to manufacture regenerative receivers, DeForest went back to court and this time won. In two separate cases, the Supreme Court ruled that DeForest, not Armstrong, was the inventor of regeneration. This was bad enough, but then Armstrong lost another court battle. Although he had invented the superheterodyne receiver while in France in 1918, it was based partly on a crude, barely functional converter designed by a Frenchman. Despite the obvious superiority of Armstrong's design, the courts ruled against him again. Desperate for a success to reverse these setbacks, Armstrong turned to the idea of FM. At that time, the late 1920s, the concept of FM was known, but it was widely believed that it was impractical, if not impossible. Armstrong, however, proved them wrong, and by 1933, 1934, had developed an operational, noise-free, wideband FM system. He offered it to RCA, which had the first right of refusal. RCA, for reasons we will see in a moment, declined to fully develop FM, and Armstrong turned to GE. In Schenectady, he found an ally in W.R.G. Baker, a GE vice president, who saw the potential in FM. With GE's help, he continued to develop FM, got the FCC to allocate a slice of the VHF spectrum for FM broadcasting from 42 to 50 megacycles, and set up his first FM broadcasting station, W2XMN, in Alpine, New Jersey. With two other pioneer FM stations, W1XPW in Meridian, Connecticut, and W2XOY in Schenectady, coming on the air in 1939 and 1940, the new Yankee network was up and running. Armstrong was convinced that, once the war ended, FM would completely replace AM as the broadcasting standard, and he wanted a large chunk of VHF frequencies to accommodate it. Brigadier General David Sarnoff and RCA For the first 45 years of its corporate life, RCA was Sarnoff, and vice versa. From his humble beginnings as a telegraph boy and the wireless operator who copied the Olympic wireless signals about the doomed Titanic, he had risen quickly in the Marconi organization and was with RCA from the start. Sarnoff had watched the progress of his old friend Armstrong as he developed FM. However, he had other plans for RCA. 
Sarnoff was convinced that television was the future and radio was the past. Throughout the 1930s, he had poured millions of RCA's dollars into an all-electronic television system to replace the crude mechanical spinning disc sets that were in the experimental stage. By the late 1930s, he had a viable, all-electronic system ready to go. On April 20th, 1939, at the New York World's Fair, Sarnoff introduced commercial television to the world using the slices of VHF spectrum that the FCC had set aside for experimental television. Sarnoff's interest in the VHF frequencies extended beyond obtaining large allocations for television. He also wanted to minimize the frequencies available for FM broadcast. To him, radio was simply radio, an old technology made obsolete by television. He also realized that the public had a limited amount of disposable income available, and he wanted every spare dollar to be spent on TV sets, not FM radios. Sarnoff saw FM broadcasting as a serious threat to his beloved child, and he wasn't going to allow FM to gobble precious VHF frequencies that he felt rightfully belonged to television. William Paley and CBS Although only a supporting player in this drama, William Paley and his CBS network almost changed the course of TV history and, at one point, had both the FCC and the Supreme Court on their side. Paley, through the genius of Peter Goldmark, one of CBS's top engineers, had developed a working color television system with brilliant, lifelike colors more than a decade before the RCA color system was remotely viable. In 1940, as CBS was looking for a way to get past Sarnoff and RCA's stranglehold of patents on their all-electronic black and white system, Peter Goldmark came up with the solution. Going back to the 1920s and the mechanical spinning disc, Goldmark developed a hybrid electronic mechanical system using the spinning disc, which CBS now called the color wheel, with red, blue, and green filters, he scanned it with an electron beam. On the receiving end, a similar color wheel, synchronized to spin at the same speed, detected the color signal. On August 28th and September 4th, 1940, CBS gave demonstrations of their color TV system to the FCC. The FCC was very impressed with the vivid, sharp clarity of the colors they saw on the screen. By contrast, RCA's color system was an embarrassing flop. In addition to wanting television to start off directly with color, Goldmark was also convinced that the post-war frequency allocations for TV should be on UHF, not VHF. In fact, CBS was so sure that the UHF color system would be the industry standard that they had no plans at all to apply for any VHF TV license. And so, the players in this drama wait in the wings for their cue to come out on the stage. How will they react to the FCC's first VHF allocations proposal issued in late 1944? Who will live past Act One? Who will make it to the final curtain call? The ancient amateur archives with front row seats will have the answers. A Ham's Christmas by the late Walter A. Tompkins, K6 ATX. Twas the night before Christmas, and in the ham shack was the warm glow of tubes in the transmitter rack. The logbook was brought up to date with great care in case the FCC might someday be there. XYL and harmonics were snug in their beds. No Tennessee Indians to addle their heads. I plugged in the mic and my new VFO getting all set for a nice QSO. When from the relays there rose such a clatter, I yanked the big switch to see what was the matter. And then up on the roof, by the two-meter beam, there came QRM like a heterodyne scream. On Gonset, on Babcock, on Viking, and Elmac, on Ranger, on Collins, on Heathkit, and IMAC. Bias to the grid and volts to the plate, just watch that S-meter while we all modulate. As I turned on the rig and reached for a dial, from the antenna tuner, Santa slid with a smile. An RF choke he held tight in his teeth, coax encircling his head like a wreath. A bundle of ham gear he had flung on his back. Was that my name on a new power pack? 
He had a stub nose like an egg insulator, and his cheeks glowed bright red like a hot oscillator. He spoke not a word, but went straight to his work, laying out all the gear, then turned with a jerk, and laying a wave meter alongside his nose said, Please, QSL, and up the feeders he rose. He climbed up that dipole to his team, gave a whistle, and away they all flew like a jet-propelled missile. But I heard his last signal from the ionosphere. 73! 88! And a happy new year. Foundations of Amateur Radio Recently I discussed the concept of a VFO, a Variable Frequency Oscillator. It's an essential building block for our amateur radio community. In describing the idea behind it, while making an error in one of the CB radio frequencies, thanks to Ben, Victor Kilo 6, November Charlie Bravo for picking that up, I skirted around how a VFO actually works. In reality, the VFO is a collective term that describes a whole range of different methods to vary a frequency. Naturally, I continued my exploration and discovered a whole range of documentation on the subject. I even started writing about how one common method, a phase-locked loop or PLL, works and how a VCO, a voltage-controlled oscillator, operates as part of that. I'll come back to those shortly. In doing my reading, since, as is often the case, I use my weekly contribution to the world as a method to learn things. I'll investigate a topic and attempt to describe who came up with it, what it means, how it works, and what its place is in the world. The who, where, why, and what of it, if you like. I suspect that comes from my very first introduction to broadcast radio, where that was one of the very first things I was taught, 30 years or so ago. If you've followed along for the decade I've been at this, you'll know that I also intersperse such learning with observations about the things that I'm interested in. This is such an observation, a meta-view, if you will. I discovered somewhat to my chagrin that the ways that an essential component of our hobby, a system called a phase-locked loop, was described in such academic terms, complete with formulas and detailed circuits and even component lists, spread over pages and pages of verbiage or explained in YouTube videos lasting an hour or more. Of course, there were some little gems, Electronic Notes on YouTube manages to cover the basics in little over six minutes, but that's a rare example. It reminded me of a website that I've been using to fill in the gaps in my understanding of SDR, or Software Defined Radio, and Digital Signal Processing, or DSP. The PiSDR.org site is an online textbook written by Dr. Mark Lichtman. He says about his method, Instead of burying ourselves in equations, an abundance of images and animations are used to help convey the concepts. My weekly efforts have always attempted to do exactly that, and I found myself in a place where such a thing didn't appear to exist for the concepts behind the PLL and VCO. My obvious response to that would be to write the missing document, and as I said, I have a first draft of it sitting on my computer. There's only one problem. I don't yet grok the concepts. If you're unfamiliar with what grokking is, it means to understand intuitively and emphatically. It also means that unless I can describe it in less than a single page of A4 paper, I don't understand what I'm saying, and you'll get bored waiting for me to make a point. Here's my point. How do you learn concepts? What is it that you do to discover new topics of interest, and how do you progress through the various stages between discovery and grokking? For me, it's about puzzle pieces. It's always been puzzle pieces, little nuggets of information, almost trivial on their own. But after a while, you get to a point where you have enough of them that you can start joining them together to grasp a more complex concept. Here's a puzzle piece I discovered today. Impedance. The difference between an explosion in air and one underwater is impedance. It's little concepts like that which make me get out of bed and discover what's on the horizon next. I'm also learning about double and triple conversion superheterodyne radio, 
which I believe has a one-on-one -on -one parallel application in software-defined radio and digital signal processing. Once I figure out how to describe it to you, I'll let you know. The point of all this is that learning things is as much about understanding as it is about explaining. Feel free to point me at new and interesting basic concepts. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. A new de-expedition is coming up for older amateurs. The South Pacific Island nation of Vanuatu isn't exactly roughing it. There's a power grid, commercial airspace, homes to rent, and a population of more than 40,000 people. For a group of adventurous amateurs with the average age of 70, that makes it a great spot for a de-expedition. Van Herridge, N4VGE, is a born traveler, and though he calls South Carolina home, he's always looking for adventure beyond his home. Now, he and a group of older amateurs will follow that roving spirit to Vanuatu in the South Pacific. The group has planned a two-week de-expedition in December of 2024, and it will include participation in that year's ARRL 10-meter contest. The men are bringing all the necessary equipment and are also bringing their wives, because this DX has hotels, restaurants, beaches, and other attractions to make it a family holiday. DXers already know that Vanuatu ranks 100th on the DXCC list of 340 countries. For this team, however, it ranks number one as a good spot to aim for more than 50,000 QSOs using CW, single sideband, RIDI, and FT8. They are looking for four more radio operators inviting them to bring their spouses to make this a great team. Van asked that interested D expeditioners contact them at Van Herridge, that's V A N H E R R I D G, at gmail.com. Meanwhile, the team also is working on developing a website and seeking sponsors. According to Funk Telegram magazine, an antenna friendly change in the state building laws is expected to be adopted in Baden Wurttemberg in Germany. This is the same state in which ham radio Friedrichshafen, Europe's largest ham fest, takes place every year. This new regulation will permit antennas to be installed on masts as high as 15 meters, or nearly 50 feet, in residential areas, and 20 meters, or 65 feet, outside of residential areas without the need for planning permission. Until now, the state's height limit was 10 meters, or 32 feet, consistent with the other states in Germany. Proponents of this change are hoping this will enable more complete digital cell phone coverage without the burden of paperwork previously associated with the antenna installation. The fact that the law applies to all radio masts would, of course, be a benefit to radio hams in the state as well. The state parliament is expected to debate the draft law change soon, and if approved, its enactment would come shortly afterwards. Meanwhile, Germany's proposed new N-Class entry-level license could be in place as early as January the 1st of 2023. The possible addition is being reviewed by the German regulator as a way to add a third license class to the existing E-Novice and A full license classes. A change in the regulations would give N-Class operators call signs with the prefix DN and the current DN call signs, which are only used for training purposes under supervision of a licensed TAM, would be cancelled on December 31st of this year to be replaced by the use of a DN prefix. Bruce Page KK5DO has filed his weekly AMSAT report, and with so many launch opportunities coming around, it's nice to see another satellite on its way to orbit. CAMSAT launched CAS-10 or XW-4 on November 12th in a cargo ship to the Chinese space station. It is scheduled to be deployed on December 15th with a 42.9 degree inclination. That satellite will have a VU linear transponder with a downlink on 435.180 MHz and an uplink on 145.870 MHz. The CW beacon will be on 435.575 MHz. One unique feature of the satellite is an onboard camera. As it takes pictures, they are stored on a flash memory. Hams can send a DTMF tone sequence to the satellite, and the satellite will transmit those pictures. The use of CW to send telemetry makes it easy for hams to receive the information without the need for any decoding software. And with Thanksgiving approaching, Bruce would like to wish all of the AMSAT uh, volunteers and users hope and, uh, and your family have a safe and happy holiday.
It is time for the weekly propagation forecast report brought to us each week by Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, Washington, who reports that at 0334 UTC on November 18th, the Australian Space Weather Forecast Center issued this geomagnetic disturbance warning. A moderately large coronal hole will rotate into a geo-effective location on November 19th. Combined with possible weak glancing interaction of recent CMEs, geomagnetic activity is expected in the coming days. Increased geomagnetic activity expected due to coronal hole high-speed wind streams from November 19th and 20th, 2022. Sunspot numbers and solar flux did not seem to correlate this week. Flux rose and spots fell. Average daily sunspot numbers declined from 79.8 to 72.3, but average solar flux rose from 129 to 137.2. This suggests the number and area of sunspots was less, but the 10.7 centimeter radiation from those spots increased. A new sunspot emerged on November 10th, another on November 13th, and two more on November 16th, the last day of our reporting week, which runs Thursday through the following Wednesday. Another sunspot group emerged the next day on November 17th. So exactly how is this sunspot cycle progressing? Well, looking back one year ago in our report, the average daily sunspot number was only 36.4. Solar flux was at 89.1. So if the activity seems a bit lackluster, we can see the cycle making steady progress. Solar cycle 25 is expected to peak around July 2025, about 32 months from now. So why do we care about these numbers? Well, we get better HF propagation at higher frequencies when X-rays from the sun are more intense and they correlate with sunspot numbers and the 10.7 centimeter radiation. This radiation changes the ionosphere, increasing density. For example, back in 1957 through 1959, at the peak of solar cycle 19, the radiation was so intense that 10 meters was open worldwide around the clock. Solar cycle 19 had by far the highest sunspot count in recorded history with nothing like it before or since. So taking a look ahead, here is the prediction for the solar flux. 120 on November 20th and 21st, 122 on November 22nd, 125 on November 23rd and 24th, 115 on November 25th and 26th, 120 and 125 on November 27th and 28th, and 130 on November 29th and 30th. The predicted planetary A index is up next, which gives us a clue into possible geomagnetic unrest will be 16, 20, and 12 on November 19th through the 21st, then 8, 5, 8, 15, and 18 on November 22nd through the 26th, and then 12, 8, 5, 5, 12, 18, and 8 on November 27th through December 3rd. The ARRL 10-meter contest is coming up and will take place during the weekend of December 10th and 11th, and you can expect better propagation than we saw in 2020 and 2021. In contesting this week on November 24th, the RSGB 80 meter autumn series, that is CW. On November 25th, it's the CQ Worldwide DX contest, also CW. On November 28th, the RSGB FT4 contest, FT4 there. On November 29th, the Worldwide Sideband Activity Contest, that's phone. And on November 30th, the UKE ICC 80 Meter Contest, that is CW. And some upcoming section, state, and division conventions you might want to be aware of. On December 9th and 10th, it's the Tampa Bay Ham Fest, hosting the ARRO West Central Florida Section Convention, that's in Plant City, Florida. January 7th, uh, Ham Radio University hosting the ARRL New York City Long Island Section Convention. That is an online event. And on January 20th through the 21st, the Southwest Florida Regional Ham Fest hosted by the ARRL Southern Florida Section Convention. And that is in Fort Myers, Florida. With the past few months bringing great weather for outdoor activations, parks on the air QSOs have grown by a high percentage. Matt here, N3NWV, brings us the latest statistics. Hi everyone, I'm Matt and 3NWV here with your October 2022 POTUS stats and news update. October included the fall Support Your Parks weekend event and the stats show a big jump from last month. We had 15,781 activations by 2,808 activators from 5,483 parks. 
47 DXCC entities were represented this month, and we reached a total of 706,846 CUSOs, a month-over-month -month increase of 29%. Congratulations to all of our category leaders for October, and as always, a big thank you to everyone who participates in the POTA program. Speaking of participating, our Park-A-Day Bailey Sprott list hasn't changed notably this month. We still have five activators and two dozen hunters on track for pressing the POTA button every day in 2022. Good luck to all now that we're down to the final two months of the year. The October 15th and 16th Support Your Parks weekend was a huge success, generating over 100,000 CUSOs. Nearly 1,100 activators got to over 1,500 parks and worked over 15,000 hunters. All in all, 34 DXCC entities participated in the weekend one way or another. That wraps it up for this month. 7-3 and POTA on! ARRL reports the passing of George Lillenstein, AB1GL, who died on November 18th, 2022. Lillenstein was a member of the volunteer team at ARRL headquarters, contributing his time to help visitors and guests get on the air from W1AW and to the Maximum uh, Memorial Station. He was an ARRL life member and donor, and also president of the Newington Amateur Radio League from 2017 to 2022, and an active member of the Bears of Manchester. He held previous appointments, including ARRL Connecticut uh, Section Manager Coordinator and District Emergency Coordinator for the Kinetic Amateur Radio Emergency Service. Dayton Hamvention 2023 is just over six months away, and next year's Hamvention team has selected innovation as the event theme. John Ross, KB8 IDJ, is here with more details. The team reports that in just one word, the theme encompasses the world of amateur radio today. There are so many exciting innovations worldwide in amateur radio. We want to capture the spirit, and we expect to see many of these throughout the coming year and presented at Hamvention 2023. Said Hamvention 2023 spokesman Michael Coulter, WHCI. Dayton Hamvention is the largest annual amateur radio gathering in the U.S. and among the largest in the world. With nearly 700 volunteers, next year's event boasts more than 500 indoor exhibits and more than 2,500 outdoor exhibits. They will showcase the latest in amateur radio equipment, technology, and computer software and hardware, along with hard-to-find radio and computer accessories and equipment. In a message to the 2022 exhibitors, Inside Invention Chairman Mike Bolger announced on Friday 14th that the online vendor portal is now open to accept credit card orders for the 2023 show. There will be no price increase for the vendor booths, and early bird pricing is available through March 15th of 2023. Inside exhibit vendors who had booths for the 2022 show will have until March 15th to pay for their booths in full. And all booths not paid for by March 15th will be made available to the public at the full rate. ARRL is planning its large exhibit area and overall participation for the event. And Hamvention is an ARRL-sanctioned event. I'm John Ross, KD8 IDJ. Hamvention 2023 runs from May 19th through the 21st at the Greene County Fairgrounds in Zinnia, Ohio. Tickets are on sale now and can be purchased at hamvention.org slash purchase dash tickets. More information about Hamvention 2023 is available on their website. The Dodge County Amateur Radio Emergency Service has received the 2022 Disaster Volunteer Award at the Serve Nebraska Step Forward Awards Luncheon on November 4th, 2022. Presented by Nebraska First Lady Susan Shore, the award recognizes Dodge County Aries for a critical role in responding to the 2019 flooding in Fremont, Nebraska, and the surrounding areas. Dodge County Aries took significant steps to ensure that the Fremont community is always prepared. Amateur radio operator Steve Naren's WB0VNF was cited for his role in retrofitting a county communications trailer for setup and use by first responders. The group participated in a full-scale disaster drill with the Nebraska Army National Guard, Fremont Police, and Fremont Fire Department to test their skills and demonstrate how their services fit in among other disaster response efforts. During severe weather, they monitor weather conditions and report to the National Weather Service for its use in issuing severe weather warnings for Dodge County. The group was nominated for the award by Dodge County Emergency Manager Tom Smith. Selection for the award was made by Nebraska Governor Pete Ricketts. The Serve Nebraska Step Forward Awards recognize exemplary volunteers across the state for their time and service aimed at making their communities better. 
The awards are the most prestigious awards given for volunteerism in the state of Nebraska. Dodge County Aries was among 11 2022 honorees. For more information about the ARRL Amateur Radio Emergency Service, please visit www.arrl.org slash Aries. That's A-R-E-S. As promised, the FCC has released its first draft of a new broadband availability map meant to more accurately represent broadband coverage as the Biden administration pushes tens of billions of dollars towards its universal broadband pledge. The new interactive map shows location-level information about broadband availability, an upgrade from the census-level data the Federal Communications Commission previously collected, and which had allowed some broadband dead zones to appear live if they were in census blocks with service elsewhere. The FCC has signaled the maps are an ongoing process that will be improved by challenges to any errors. The better maps were mandated by Congress, but the FCC was already at work on improving its broadband data collection, which had been roundly criticized on the Hill. Today is an important milestone in our effort to help everyone, everywhere, get specific information about what broadband options are available for their homes and pinpointing places in the country where communities do not have the service they need, FCC Chair Jessica Rosenworcel said. By painting a more accurate picture of where broadband is and is not, local, state, and federal partners can better work together to ensure no one is left on the wrong side of the digital divide. Those state partners are particularly in need of assistance as they hand out tens of billions in new broadband subsidy money. In addition to the map, the FCC also launched an updated version of its speed test app that broadband subs can use to compare their actual mobile broadband performance and coverage to their providers' reported performance and coverage, then submit that information as part of a challenge to the map if their service coverage doesn't measure up. After a super cyclone flattened the coast of Odisha in India in 1999, Kriti Chandra Baral lost his family and his memory, the latter possibly from some kind of trauma. Meanwhile, never learning for certain the fate of their patriarch, his sons presumed their father was one of the thousands who've lost their lives in that natural disaster. The man survived, however, and lived as a vagrant on the streets of a city of Andhra Pradesh, existing for years on handouts and people's generosities. Ten years ago, he was taken in by a group known as the Missionaries of Charity after one of his benefactors discovered his health had deteriorated and asked that he be accepted into their care. The charity's ongoing efforts to locate his family failed until November 19th when they contacted the West Bengal Radio Club, which has extensive experience in assisting with reunions of missing persons and their families. The Hams had helped the charity before, and the group was hopeful that the radio amateurs would succeed where the charity had not. Ambarish Nag Bizwaz, VU2JFA, the club secretary, said after some time, the amateur radio club was able to locate the man's sons. He told various Indian news media outlets that two of the sons were dumbstruck when they saw their father's photograph and then started weeping. They were a well-to-do family and said their father went missing after the cyclone and was presumed dead. In video shared online by Ambarish Nag Bizwaz, the family can be seen with their father at the Missionaries of Charity residence. They are overcome by emotion, hugging one another for the first time in more than two decades. The Radio Society of Great Britain is devoting the entire month of December to reliving amateur radio history by marking the centenary of the transatlantic tests, which firmly established that amateur radio communications should cross the ocean, the RSGB has activated historic call signs to mark the series of historic moments 100 years ago. The successful one-way transatlantic radio communications show that HF bands can be well-suited for amateur signals crossing an entire ocean. The first amateur transmission from Europe using the call sign of G5WS was heard in North America on December 24th of 1922. The RSGB is inviting society members to participate in the month-long celebration by activating a station and is encouraging the rest of the world to listen. The contacts this time will be via two-way communication with awards available to operators logging QSOs with stations using the historic call sign. 
In England, there are G5WS, G5AT, G6XX, G6ZZ, and G3DR. The station in Scotland will be GM5WS. Wales will be using GW5WS and Northern Ireland G15WS. In the English Channel, operators from the Crown Dependency of Guernsey will be using GU5WS, and those from Jersey will use GJ5WS. Operators from the Isle of Man, another Crown Dependency in the Irish Sea, will be using GD5WS. Radio frequency interference, better known as RFI, has become an issue for many radio amateurs in the past decade. Solar energy systems, LEDs, switching power supplies, dimmers, variable speed motor controllers, and other nonlinear devices have all raised the noise floor. This impacts radio amateurs across the board, including those participating in emergency communications, traffic handling, and those talking with friends on the air. In some cases, it makes communicating via amateur radio all but impossible. To combat this problem, the ARRL New England Division has created teams to help radio amateurs find sources of RFI and eliminate or reduce the interference. These teams are also able to provide additional assistance when required, such as working with utility companies, the ARRL, or even the FCC. A $23,640 grant for Amateur Radio Digital Communications, or ARDC, will allow the New England Division to purchase radio frequency interference equipment for each of the seven sections in their division. Each kit will have the following equipment. ICOM IC705 transceiver outfitted with a backpack and spare battery for RFI detection and spectrum capture. DX engineering noise loop receiving antenna and a DXENLPREATT1 preamplifier attenuator to detect sources of high frequency RFI. Elk antennas 2 meter slash 440 L5 dual band antenna for locating RFI sources in the VHF and UHF portions of the spectrum. In addition, the division will be purchasing a radar engineering RE243 broadband RFI locator for detecting power line noise and a radar engineering RE245 circuit sniffer for detecting indoor noise sources. This equipment will be dispatched to the sections when needed. The funds will also help the division with on-site training for all seven New England section teams. Rob Lydon, K1UI, Assistant Director for Spectrum Protection and Utilization, notes, This grant will really help our dedicated teams combat RFI throughout the New England division. Amateur Radio Digital Communications is a California-based foundation with roots in amateur radio and the technology of Internet communications. The organization got its start by managing the AMPR net address space, which is reserved for licensed amateur radio operators worldwide. Additionally, ARDC makes grants to projects and organizations that follow amateur radio's practice and tradition of technical experimentation in both amateur radio and digital communication science. Such experimentation has led to advances that benefit the general public, including the mobile phone and wireless internet technology. ARDC envisions a world where all such technology is available through open source hardware and software, and where anyone has the ability to innovate upon it. To learn more about ARDC, go to www.ampr.org. Omotenashi, a project of the JAXA Ham Radio Club, was a secondary payload aboard NASA's Artemis One mission, launched on November 16th. It plans to land on the surface of the moon and to transmit a beacon in the amateur 70-centimeter band. Controllers have reported Amatanashi is tumbling, making it difficult for the spacecraft to charge its batteries and communicate with the ground. Of the 10 CubeSats flown as secondary payloads, seven are in operation, two have not been heard from, and Amatanashi is struggling. Controllers are continuing recovery attempts. Amatsunashi is derived from outstanding moon exploration technologies demonstrated by Nano Semi-Hard Impactor. Amatsunashi is also a Japanese word for hospitality. The JAXA Ham Radio Club planned to utilize the flight demonstration opportunity of the Amatsunashi mission to conduct the following amateur radio missions. To conduct technological research with respect to receiving ultra-weak UHF signal from a space probe toward the moon, and to conduct an outreach activity providing amateur radio operators all over the world with an opportunity to try to receive signals from the moon region. 
Amatanashi is a 6U CubeSat with external dimensions of 239 by 366 by 113 millimeters and an approximate mass of 14 kilograms. Amatanashi consists of three modules, orbiting module, retro motor module, and surface probe. During the moon transfer orbit, these modules are integrated. When Amatanashi arrives at the moon, the surface probe will be separated and conduct a semi-hard landing. If control is regained, Amatanashi will be actively controlled by ultra-small attitude control system including star tracker, sun sensor, IMU, reaction wheel, and cold gas jet thruster. During the moon transfer orbit, Amatanashi may be spin-stabilized due to the strict resources. There will be UHF-CM, PSK, PM, and PSK-31 beacons with one watt of output on both the orbiting module and the surface probe. The CIS Lunar Explorer, the MIT Kick Cube, and Lunar Ice Cube are expected to share the same launch. The Indian National Academy of Engineering will induct Dr. Ulrich Rode, N1UL, as a fellow during ceremonies in mid-December. John Ross, KD8 IDJ from League Headquarters, is here with more. Dr. Rode is only the third foreign fellow elected by INAE, preceded by Dr. Jeffrey Wineland, who won a Nobel Prize in Physics, and Dr. Philip H. Knight. In the formal announcement issued on November 19, 2022, the INAE thanked Dr. Rode for his outstanding contributions to engineering and also as for his dynamic leadership in engineering domain, which have immensely contributed for the faster development of the country. The INAE, founded in 1987, comprises India's most distinguished engineers, engineer scientists, and technologists, covering the entire spectrum of engineering disciplines. Dr. Rote has been an avid amateur radio operator, holding several licenses in the United States and Germany. He's been licensed since 1956 and involved mostly in technology and systems. In 2015, he won first place in the ARRL International DX contest in the northern New Jersey section. It's great to see Dr. Rode get this award, said Ed Hare, W1RFI, ARRR Laboratory Manager. His contributions to technology have clearly been global in scope, and even though his accomplishments have been clearly professional, amateur radio has also played a role in his being a world-class engineer. The ARRL Lab has appreciated his help and support over decades of time, and we join him in offering our congratulations for another important achievement. I'm John Ross, KD8 IDJ. Dr. Rode also operates N1UL stroke MM on his yacht, the Dragonfly, and is trustee of the Marco Island Radio Club K5MI. The ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, recognized Dr. Rode as the 2022 recipient of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers Photonics Society Engineering Achievement Award. The award is for outstanding engineering achievement in the field of optoelectronic signal generation and optical measurement equipment for next generation intelligent optical networks. Dr. Rode is an ARRL Maxim Society and Life member. Amateur radio operators who like to track balloons and now have multiple targets. Earlier this week, three PICO balloons were launched from the new Mayer Station 3 in Antarctica, a German Antarctic research station of the Alfred Wegener Institute. Todd J. McKinney, KN4TPG, from the University of Alabama in Huntsville, is at the facility and will be launching a series of 20 and 10 meter weak signal propagation reporter balloons. Look for them on APRSDOT.FI under the following call signs K4UAH 1 2 3 4 5 6 and 7, as well as W5KUB 114 and 115. Actual WSPR call signs on 20 meters are as follows. KN4TPG, KW5GP, KM4LVC, WB8ELK, KM4YHI, KM4ZIA, and KD9UQB. On 10 meters, the WSPR call sign will be WB4VHF. Amateur radio operators with WSPR stations that have directional antennas or beverage style antennas are needed to monitor the 20-meter WSPR band and turn their antennas towards Antarctica. KN4TPG and KW5GP are approaching McMurdo Station to the south of Australia and New Zealand. NASA astronaut and former U.S. Air Force Colonel Bob Behnken, KG5GGX, is retiring from NASA after 22 years of service. His last day with the agency was Friday, November 11th. 
Behnken's career highlights included 93 days in space on two Space Shuttle Endeavour flights and the first crewed flight of the SpaceX Dragon spacecraft. Behnken was pilot and joint operations commander for the first crewed flight test of the SpaceX Dragon. Known as Demo-2, that flight launched Behnken and former NASA astronaut Doug Hurley to the International Space Station May 30, 2020 and safely returned them to Earth August 2, 2020. Behnken joined NASA at Johnson in July 2000 as an astronaut candidate. On his first space flight in 2008, Behnken was a Space Shuttle Endeavour mission specialist for the STS-123 delivery of the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency's Kibo Laboratory and the Canadian Space Agency's Special Purpose Dexterous Manipulator to the space station, also known as Dexter. Behnken performed three spacewalks and operated the station's robotic arm both with and without Dexter attached. He flew again in 2010 as a mission specialist for STS-130, which delivered the station's tranquility module and its cupola, the station's seven-window Earth-facing observation post. He served as the mission's lead spacewalker, performing three additional spacewalks to install the newly arrived module. Behnken completed 10 spacewalks across his three missions, spending more than 61 hours working in the vacuum of space. Behnken grew up in St. Anne, Missouri, and graduated from Pattonville High School in Maryland Heights, Missouri. He earned dual Bachelor of Science degrees in Physics and Mechanical Engineering from Washington University in St. Louis in 1992, a Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering from California Institute of Technology in Pasadena in 1993, and a Doctorate in Mechanical Engineering from the California Institute of Technology in 1997. Behnken was commissioned via the Air Force Reserve Officers Training Corps and attended the Air Force Test Pilot School at Edwards Air Force Base in California. Before retiring from active military service in February 2022, Behnken had achieved the rank of colonel and flown more than 2,000 flight hours in more than 25 different types of aircraft. Now 11 days into its mission, NASA's Artemis One Orion spacecraft is providing mission control teams with a wealth of important data and hitting a few space exploration milestones along the way. On Saturday morning, November 26th at 7.42 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, Orion broke the record for farthest distance traveled by a spacecraft designed to carry humans to deep space and safely return them to Earth. Flying in distant retrograde orbit, distant in the sense that it's a high altitude from the lunar surface, and retrograde because Orion will travel around the moon opposite the direction the moon travels around the Earth, Orion will surpass the previous record of 248,655 statute miles, which was set by the Apollo 13 crew in 1970. Orion is expected to reach its maximum distance of more than 270,000 statute miles from Earth at 4.13 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Monday, November 28th. Orion's flight records, while impressive, serve an important purpose. By testing Orion in a variety of situations, NASA's teams will better understand how the spacecraft performs in space and prepare for future missions that are crewed. Orion will spend an additional 15 days in flight on its 25 and a half day journey before re-entering Earth's atmosphere and splashing down in the Pacific Ocean on Sunday, December 11th. Increasing demand for radio frequency spectrum globally has made its effective management critical to all aspects of human endeavors worldwide and throughout the universe. This limited natural resource is regulated at the global level by the International Telecommunication Union, the United Nations Agency for Information and Communication Technologies. Spectrum needs to be coordinated internationally to prevent harmful interference, which endangers the functioning of radio-based safety services or seriously degrades, obstructs, or repeatedly interrupts other types of radio communication services. Harmonizing spectrum supports more efficient overall use of the radio spectrum, particularly by space-based systems and other globally deployed services, as well as reducing the complexity of connected devices that can roam internationally. While spectrum harmonization can also increase economies of scale, make connectivity more affordable, and even support emergency communications, coordinating spectrum is both technically and geopolitically complex. Luckily, as part of its membership capacity building efforts, ITU hosts the biennial World Radio Communication Seminars to ensure spectrum experts and newcomers alike are up to speed on the latest radio communication regulatory requirements and procedures, as well as technical advances and trends. 
World Radio Communication Conferences are held every three to four years to review and, if necessary, revise the radio regulations, the international treaty governing the use of the radio frequency spectrum, and the geostationary satellite and non-geostationary satellite orbits. The next scheduled ITU World Radio Communication Conference 2023 will be held in Dubai, United Arab Emirates, from November 20th to December 15th, 2023. Revisions are made on the basis of an agenda determined by the International Telecommunications Union Council, which takes into account recommendations made by previous World Radio Communication Conferences. The general scope of the agenda of the World Radio Communication Conferences is established four to six years in advance, with the final agenda set by the ITU Council two years before the conference, with the concurrence of the majority of the member states. Under the terms of the ITU Constitution, a World Radio Communication Conference can revise the radio regulations and any associated frequency assignments and allotment plans, address any radio communication matter of worldwide character, instruct the Radio Regulations Board and Radio Communication Bureau, and review their activities and determine questions for study by the Radio Communication Assembly and its study groups in preparation for future radio communication conferences. On October 24, 2022, hundreds of telecommunication experts from around the world flocked to the ITU's Geneva headquarters to attend WRS 22, a week-long deep dive into the work of the Radio Communication Sector and Radio Communication Bureau, the entities responsible for regulating spectrum and satellite orbits globally. Unlike most United Nations organizations, the ITU allows its entities from the private sector to become affiliated as sector members or associates. Sector members can participate in study groups which perform vital functions, such as preparing technical studies that underpin decisions made by World Radio Communication Conferences, which update the radio regulations every four years. And now, here are a few quick amateur satellite-related items from all over. The latest episode of the ARRL On The Air podcast features details from AVID satellite operator Sean Kutzko, KX9X, about how to get started on the amateur satellites, an activity that's available to hams in all licensed classes. Sean's article, Ham Radio Satellites, Reliable, Accessible, and Enjoyable, is also the cover piece of the November-December issue of ARRL's On The Air magazine. A cargo spacecraft successfully docked with the International Space Station November 9th, despite making its two-day trek through space with only one functioning solar panel. The Cygnus spacecraft, which was carrying 8,200 pounds of scientific equipment and supplies for the astronauts on board the ISS, lifted off from NASA's launch site in Wallops Island, Virginia, atop an Antares rocket on November 7th. A few hours after Cygnus reached orbit, one of the spacecraft's two solar arrays failed to deploy, NASA announced. NASA and Northrop Grumman, which designed and built the Cygnus capsule, opted to abandon efforts to open the array in order to focus on carrying out a safe rendezvous with the ISS, noting that the spacecraft already had sufficient power to finish its journey. SpaceX launched one of its reusable Falcon 9 rocket boosters for the last time Saturday on a rear expendable mission for Intelsat devoting all of the launcher's propellant toward placing a pair of television broadcast satellites into orbit. Intelsat says it paid SpaceX an additional fee for the expendable mission. The Falcon 9 rocket lifted off at 11.06 a.m. EST, or 16.06 GMT, Saturday after a four-day delay caused by Hurricane Nicole. The booster debuted March 2, 2019, with the first unpiloted test flight of SpaceX Crew Dragon capsule. The booster was not fitted with SpaceX's recovery hardware, such as titanium grid fins or landing legs, and SpaceX did not deploy one of its drone ships for the expendable mission. TJ Reverb, a 2-U CubeSat built by Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology, has been frequency coordinated to operate as an APRS relay on 145.825 MHz. It's scheduled for launch on the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket and Dragon spacecraft, set to deliver additional science, crew supplies, and hardware to the International Space Station next week. The satellite will be released from ISS at a later time. 
The first United States high school to send a CubeSat to space was back in 2013. Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology's Research and Educational Vehicle for Evaluating Radio Broadcast Satellite aims to study the use of iridium as a primary radio communications method. Additionally, the satellite will demonstrate using a passive magnet on board and the Earth's magnetic field for stabilization, rather than using an attitude determination and control system for pointing accuracy and stabilization. What makes this satellite even more notable is that there's a systems engineering project. The students elected space grade parts, wired the electronics for the satellite, wrote the drivers to control the different systems, and coded the flight software. What's special about TJ Reverb isn't necessarily the mission, it's what we did. These kids literally built a satellite the way the industry would build one. We selected parts from vendors and got those parts to work together, said Kristen Kuko, Robotics Lab Director and the school's space faculty advisor. This is an engineering feat, she said. With the recent late season hurricanes and early season snowstorms in some parts of the United States, everybody's talking about the weather these days. For the National Weather Service, one of their key resources in determining ground truth reports during severe weather is the Skywarn program, which is strongly supported by the amateur radio community. While hams have always played a key role in the program since its inception in 1965, one group has taken their mission way beyond Skywarn. The Southwest District Skywarn team of Western Pennsylvania offers general weather classes, training for relay and net control stations, Skywarn reporting procedures, daily rain gauge reporting with COCORAHS, and other training, along with bi monthly meetings on Zoom. They also have worked at developing relationships with adjacent National Weather Service forecast offices to provide better interconnectivity and communications during activations. Eddie Mishevitz, KB3, YRU, president of the group, said that they want to provide all things weather for those who are interested, even if they don't have a license. He also hopes that their Zoom meetings might also be a gathering place for other Skywarn leaders and volunteers in order to share information and ideas. To learn more about the Southwest District Skywarn team and meeting times, you may contact Eddie at kb3yru at arrl.net. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. One question I got via email concerning tower mounted electronics and where to start. Here's what I did on my latest 900 megahertz install. Concerning feed lines, I use the 900 megahertz band for a one-way link between my recording studio at home and the local repeater for airing this week in amateur radio. Feed line loss at 900 megahertz is horrible unless you intend to spend lots of money on pressurized semi-rigid feed line. One solution to this problem is to mount the electronics on the tower and limit the feed line to say two or three feet. It's easy to run 115 volts AC up the tower. Make sure the wires you choose to install are the outdoor type with three wires. Also check with the tower owner to be sure it's legal to do so. Probably any lighted or registered tower would require you to, to run the power wires through conduit. Actually, running conduit on the tower is rather easily since it's generally in a straight line. Okay, so you've installed the power to the place where you intend to mount the electronics and antenna. Your next job is to find a suitable cabinet. If your space requirements are small, like the size of a small HF rig, you're in luck. For those needing to obtain and tower mount a larger cabinet, here's how I handled a couple of those projects. First, we gathered all the equipment to be put in the cabinet on the tower and arranged it to take up minimal space but allow sufficient cooling airflow. Then we located a cabinet that came close to the size and height and width. I took it to a local welding shop and had them cut all the way around the outside, splicing five inches of steel to make it deeper. After the bill was paid, I sealed it with silicone and paint and tested it with a water hose for a watertight seal. I did install two drain holes in the bottom just in case. For smaller projects, marine battery cases work well for housing tower-mounted electronics. You'll need a mounting bracket of some sort and some holes in the box, but they're cheap and durable. Ham fests are good places to look to pick up plastic boxes for outside mounting. I found several with molded in nuts for mounting, clear plastic doors with key locks for real cheap, my favorite two words. Some common mounting devices for electronics on the tower are hose clamps, antenna U-bolts, 
most brass screws and nuts, as well as custom-made brackets from scrap steel. If you live in an area with a large industrial area, try to get to know someone that works as an industrial electrician who can help you scrounge old steel electrical cabinets, scrap steel, wire, and other hardware. Most of my best outdoor installations were made from old control cabinets destined for the scrap steel bin or the landfill. And while you're building your tower-mounted box, be sure to consider how to safely put it on the tower and gain access to it. Remember, money spent on books and videos relating to tower safety is always money well spent. Invest in your safety soon. Don't be a statistic. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. And finally this week, a company in France believes it has come up with the latest solution to provide battery power for micro power devices. The company i10 has developed an ultra-small rechargeable lithium battery. At first glance, the surface mount solid state battery might easily be mistaken for an SMD chip as its housing is only slightly larger than the battery's own dimensions of 3.2 by 2.5 millimeters. They are, of course, not chips. These batteries have a capacity between 0.1 milliamp hour and 0.5 milliamp hour. They were found capable of tolerating temperatures between minus 40 degrees Celsius or minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit all the way up to 85 degrees Celsius or 185 degrees Fahrenheit. Their ability to deliver peak currents make them especially useful for powering RF transmissions such as Bluetooth, Sigfox, and LTE to deliver packets of data via sensors. The website, CNX Software, also sees the batteries as being useful for sensor data loggers, beacons, and backup power supplies for microcontrollers. The solid-state technology is considered another plus, contributing toward a useful lifespan of between 10 and 20 years. The company has said the batteries are also fast charging. The website Hackaday poses the following challenge. We'd be particularly interested to learn about their temperature sensitivity when it comes to soldering, as we've taken to heart the warnings about soldering to more traditional lithium cells. The website noted that there are apparently some evaluation kits available directly from the company in France. This Week in Amateur Radio is holding open auditions for news anchors for the weekly national worldwide amateur radio news service. If you have a good radio voice and can reliably read provided news copy, we are looking for you. This, of course, is an all-volunteer position, and amateur radio license is not required. You must have a high-quality microphone, headset mics are not used, and be familiar with audio editing software to record and edit your finished news stories before uploading. If you would like to try out for a weekly or bi-weekly anchor position with North America's premier amateur radio news on air and podcast, please send an email to our producer, George, W2XBS. You can include a sample MP3 of yourself reading news copies sent as an attachment to W2XBS77 at gmail.com. That's whiskey, the number two, X-Ray Bravo Sierra 77 at gmail.com. Be sure and use Anchor Audition in the subject line. Please include your phone number and a good window of time for a callback to discuss your submission and our operating logistics to see if This Week in Amateur Radio is a good fit for you. We hope to hear from you soon. Many of the news and information items heard on this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Audio News Service, and the AWRL Letter. The Southgate Amateur News Service, Steve Richards, G4 Hotel Papa Echo, and the Southgate Vibes News Service. AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom. The South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, and the Australian Communications and Media Authority. The New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters. The Amateur Radio Newsline, The Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, The Tech Guy, Leo Laporte, The International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters around the country and around the world on great repeater systems like WA3PBD repeater system, on Thursday evenings at 7.30 p.m. on 146.730 and 223.940, covering all of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and beyond. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. 
If you would like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at twiar.net. And now for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio headquarters and all our news team around the world, this is Will Rogers, K5WLR in Fayetteville, Arkansas.